police officers take an oath to protect the community. We trust them to safeguard lives and not violate people's rights during their service. But it can be easy to forget that cops are people too. They can make mistakes and they can make bad decisions. This is particularly clear when we look at the case of 20-year-old aspiring marine biologist Ellie Warren, whose lifeless body was found near a bar on Tofo Beach in Mozambique on November 9, 2016. After her body was found, the local police dragged the case through the depths of disinterest and back. And in fact, the very police that locals relied on for protection proved to be uncaring and heartless. These so-called detectives classified Ellie's case as accidental, even though there was a sickening amount of evidence to prove otherwise. They made Ellie's grieving father travel across the globe for answers and inflicted the Warren family with insurmountable grief. And all they wanted to do was just find justice for their daughter. The case of Ellie Warren is infuriating on so many levels, not only because she lost her life at the hands of a violent criminal, but because the Mozambique police couldn't care less. Welcome to True Crime Stories. If you're new here, I post new true crime cases every single week with none of those crappy AI narrations, just you, me, and a case to solve. So if you wanna see some good old fashioned true crime documentaries, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and it'll keep you up to date with all of my future videos. Ellie Warren was born in 1996 in Melbourne, Australia. Ellie's family consists of her parents, Nicole and Paul, and a younger sister, Christy. Growing up, Ellie was a vibrant and fun-loving girl, and she loved her family to bits, but her home life wasn't exactly perfect. When Ellie was still young, her parents got divorced, but this sad and life-altering moment didn't stop Ellie from being the loving and lively person that she was. Even though her parents were no longer together, Ellie shared a close bond with both of them, but she was particularly close with her dad. Paul and Ellie were best friends. They would spend a lot of time together and visit Ellie's favorite place on Earth at the time and that was the beach. Paul adored his daughter and defined her as being a young lady who craved adventure and loved life. To Paul, Ellie was his treasure and the two were essentially inseparable. Ellie's mom, Nicole, described Ellie as a girl who was full of life. She loved adventure and had a hunger for exploring and was known to be overwhelmingly friendly. Growing up, Ellie attended Parkdale Secondary College and after high school, she had plans to enroll in James Cook University in North Queensland to pursue a career in marine biology. Ellie loved the outdoors, but if there was one thing she loved more, it was exploring different countries and their cultures, specifically Africa. So Ellie got to work. In 2016, she juggled three different jobs in hopes of affording a marine biology program in Tofo, Mozambique. See, before Ellie went away for college, she wanted to experience working with marine biologists and scientists to satisfy her inner wanderlust. It was the perfect opportunity, really. Ellie would spend time with the people there that she looked up to and explore the vast marine life in different countries of the world. So in October of 2016, Ellie accompanied the underwater diving group called Underwater Africa for six weeks in Tofo Beach, located in Mozambique, South Africa. Ellie packed her bags, bid her family farewell, and was more than ready and beyond excited to start this new life-changing adventure. Once she reached Mozambique, Ellie stayed in a bungalow that was part of Casa Berry, a popular diving resort at Tofo Beach. For six weeks, Ellie was part of a dream volunteer group. They would take a boat out to the reefs of this beautiful place, and Ellie had the time of her life underwater. She was in awe of the natural beauty, and this experience really cemented her goals for the future, and that was to help save the world, preserve marine life, and become someone who could make a difference. Ellie, during her six-week trip to Mozambique, was also in contact with her family, and her parents remembered the excitement in her voice whenever they asked her how she was doing there. Ellie was elated that she got to experience something like this, and it was something that she would remember forever. Six weeks passed in a blur with all of the activities and new underwater discoveries and sights that Ellie had experienced. And in early November of 2016, it was finally time for Ellie to go back home and start the new chapter of her life that was college. But sadly, Ellie would never board the plane back to Australia, and the very place that she loved the most turned into a dreadful pit of terror, not only for Ellie, but for her family too. November 8th, 2016 was supposed to be Ellie's last day in Mozambique. Now, there are mixed reports as to what happened next. 
Some reports say that Ellie checked into camp and met up with her friends, and it was suggested that Ellie also left some of her belongings there. But one report by the manager of the hostel where Ellie was living stated that she never checked in that day. Regardless, later that night, Ellie and her group went out to celebrate the end of their six-week program, and they spent a majority of the evening at a local bar called Victor's Bar near the beach. According to Ellie's friends, she did have a couple of drinks, but she was coherent, alert, and didn't seem drunk at all. The next day, Ellie was supposed to catch a flight back to Australia to see her parents, and she was very excited to see her family again. Ellie's parents missed her too as six weeks was the longest they'd ever been apart. But Ellie never boarded the plane. In fact, after Tuesday, Ellie failed to reach out to her family, which immediately panicked Nicole and Paul. They tried calling Ellie and everyone she knew, but they didn't hear anything promising. After some time though, Ellie's parents got a call, but it wasn't from Ellie. It was Ellie's younger sister, Christy, and she had devastating news for them. Christy was hysterical on the phone and was repeatedly heard screaming, Ellie was murdered. Ellie's parents were struck with unimaginable horror. Learning that their daughter's life had been taken was horrible enough, but the awful act being done on another continent was heart dropping. Ellie's parents were crushed with grief and they had a mountain of questions. Who did this to Ellie? Why would anyone want to hurt Ellie? What happened to her? Paul and Nicole's lives were turned upside down. Even so, Paul and Nicole were hopeful that the Mozambique authorities would get to the bottom of their daughter's tragic passing, and they thought that Ellie's case was in good hands. But Paul and Nicole trusted the wrong people, and as time passed, they realized that Mozambique investigators, well, they weren't interested in the slightest in solving Ellie's case. This began a never-ending cycle of turmoil for the Warren family, as the very people who were supposed to keep Mozambique safe from crime were the ones letting Ellie's killer walk free. Now, here's the thing. Mozambique is a beautiful place, brimmed with natural resources and breathtaking natural scenery in the form of beaches and recreational areas. But it's also a country reeling from the repercussions of civil war. The key attractions of Mozambique include endless beaches and national parks, and these are the reasons why tourism is all the rage in the country, as well as a main source of revenue. People from all over the world fly to Mozambique to experience nature's works of art and leave in awe and appreciation, and this is exactly what Ellie was doing. But as beautiful as Mozambique is, there is a lot of ugliness nestled in the roots of the country. According to approximately 55% of locals, most of the Mozambican police are corrupt. Police officers lack professionalism, work ethic, and they're quick to close cases that haven't even reached completion. Rather than properly solving a case, they just come up with some backward solution, claim it as the truth, and then close the case so that they can move on to the next one. Now, I can't say this with any certainty, but I'd be willing to bet that this happens in a lot of tourist locations. In fact, I used to live in a tourist city, and this was a pretty widely known theory that police covered up a lot of serious crimes or labeled them as less serious crimes because they didn't want to deter tourism. The next morning, a Wednesday, Ellie's lifeless body was found by a local fisherman near or inside of a public block. See, this is where the Mozambican detectives are so inconsistent with the details, but this is just one of the many frustrating things that have surfaced in Ellie's case. Initially, in Yemen police spokesperson Detective Juma Dauto ruled Ellie's death as accidental and even stressed that there was not a single mark, bruise, or cut on her body. The investigation was carried out at a snail's pace, which was very frustrating for the Warren family for obvious reasons. The first formal police report took almost six months to surface, and the details were appalling. According to it, Ellie had passed away from a drug overdose. Now, what was really bizarre was the fact that there were no drugs in her system at the time of her passing, so this was highly suspicious. Meanwhile, Ellie's parents tried to contact the Australian police, and they hoped that both investigative teams could work together to solve Ellie's case. But Mozambique flat out refused. They said the investigation was theirs alone to handle. This was both shocking and infuriating. Ellie's mom, Nicole, even launched a petition on change.org, asking the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to help solve Ellie's case and bring her justice. Within two weeks, the petition had over 36 thousand signatures. As of recently, the petition is almost at 65,000, nearing its goal of 75,000 signatures. On the other hand, Mozambican detectives were of no help. 
See, after the initial police report, another one was released four days later, and this time it stated that Ellie's passing was a homicide. But this is where things get even more confusing. Ellie's cause of death was listed as mechanical asphyxiation and the introduction of sandy contents into her lungs and mouth. Moreover, the sand found in Ellie's body was loose beach sand, whereas the place where Ellie's body was discovered was surrounded by dense, hard, and packed red dirt. So this leads to the assumption that Ellie was attacked on the beach and that her body was moved. But why? And who did this? Well, that was exactly what Ellie's parents wanted to find out. Once Ellie's dad, Paul, saw how disinterested the Mozambican police were in solving Ellie's case, and that they were being more of a hindrance than helpful in the investigation, he took matters into his own hands. One long year after Ellie's tragic passing, Paul made the move to South Africa to find answers for himself. He had one goal alone, and that was to figure out who had done such a horrific thing to his poor and innocent daughter. Paul's actions are truly commendable, and Ellie is so lucky to have a relentless and loving father like Paul because even though he's now lost his daughter and his best friend, Paul is committed to catching the wrongdoer and bringing justice and peace to Ellie. Paul didn't let his attention waver, and he was laser-focused on finding clues about his daughter's terrible passing. And it didn't take him long. Surprisingly, he discovered more things about Ellie's murder in a day than the detectives could in a year. It leads you to believe that the Mozambique authorities were either disinterested in solving Ellie's case or they wanted to protect their country's reputation because tourists disappearing and being found lifeless and humiliated in the streets of Mozambique doesn't necessarily scream safe. But the fact that Paul was able to uncover so much information in such a short amount of time, it led to one big question. Were the police truly uninterested? Or was there a chance they may have been actively covering something up? Paul, on the second day that he arrived in Tofo, went to the resort where Ellie was staying. What was so sad and heartbreaking was that he sat at the same table Ellie was photographed at on her last day in Tofo, and he was unable to control his emotions and broke down crying while feeling connected to Ellie in an almost spiritual way. It's something no father should ever have to go through. He even went around and put up notices, asking for information, and within hours, Lots of locals came forward, and Paul quickly found a very pivotal piece of information, but it was horrific to hear. See, a fisherman had forwarded a photo of Ellie to Paul, and what he saw was truly a nightmare. It was a photo of Ellie, but sadly, she wasn't alive in the photo. Rather, she lay lifeless and disrobed with injuries to her face, neck, and limbs, implying that she fought for her life till the very end. For Paul, it was a terrible sight, seeing his daughter so helpless and humiliated. It was something you can't ever unsee, which is so tragic and unfortunate. The fact that Paul was forced to see something like this, I mean, he can't help but commend the fishermen for speaking up and being so forthcoming with information, but images like this aren't meant to be seen by family members, and it's so heartbreaking to know that Paul had to witness this firsthand rather than investigators stepping in. But after seeing this photo, Paul realized something. Ellie's body position and location were completely different from what Mozambique detectives passed forward to the Warren family. Initially, the Warren family believed that Ellie was found near a public toilet block with no injuries, but this new photo led to the theory that someone had attacked Ellie and then, unfortunately, taken her life at the beach. This also corroborated the presence of beach sand in Ellie's body. Tragically, the photo also suggested something a lot more terrifying and it was the fact that Ellie had most definitely been taken advantage of, which makes the case so much darker. This photo, even though it was tragic and horrific, was proof that the local police were likely trying to cover up Ellie's loss. But something else happened that solidified this theory. During Paul's time in Mozambique in 2017 and 2018, he came across locals who'd witnessed something very odd. A woman who was one of the people who found Ellie's body was shown the photo of her body at the beach, the photo the fisherman had provided. The witness vividly remembered Ellie being placed in a very peculiar position near the aforementioned toilet block. So in this woman's eyes, how had Ellie ended up on a beach in this photo? This proved that Ellie's body was most definitely moved from the beach and it was placed near the toilet block. Interestingly, when her body was found near the toilet block, she was in a Muslim prayer position, with her backside jetted up and her face down, with her arms sprawled out in front of her head. The witness also went on to say that when she saw Ellie by the toilet block, 
police officers had already arrived. This led to the theory that it was none other than the police officers who changed the location of Ellie's body so that it looked like an accident and not a homicide. The detectives wanted to make the scene look like an intoxicated Ellie had tripped over a toilet block and passed away, or had been in the midst of prayer when she OD'd, or something of the sort. If this is true, then the local police officers must have obstructed the evidence, the actual crime scene, as well as Ellie's body, which is unbelievable. But the burning question remained, why? Why would the detectives do such a thing? And why would police officers cover up a crime scene? Were the police involved in Ellie's passing, or were they doing the dirty work for someone far more sinister? By this time, the Australian police hadn't been involved in Ellie's case, despite the countless appeals and requests made by the Warren family. But there was not a lot that Australian authorities could do, because Mozambique hadn't asked for their help, so Australian authorities weren't legally allowed to cross borders and help out, even if they wanted to. Clearly, the Mozambican police weren't doing a great job of solving Ellie's highly suspicious crime. And when Paul eventually showed all of his findings to the local Mozambique police, believe it or not, they actually confessed that Ellie's body was in fact moved. So why weren't they moving the case forward and finding the person who drove Ellie to her fateful end? Well, it turned out that the authorities of Mozambique were in no rush at all to solve Ellie's case, and shockingly, even after all the incriminating findings that came forth, Ellie's case still saw no progress, and the Mozambique police basically wrote her off and ended their investigation. The Warren family was devastated by the actions of the Mozambican police and authorities, but that didn't stop them from trying everything they could. Ellie's case received a lot of public attention, and it appeared on 60 Minutes Australia and multiple local news stations. And in 2020, someone did come to Paul's aid. It was a private German investigator, Nick Greger. He was someone who worked closely to try to bring down criminal groups, illegal activities, and a heap of other sketchy things in Africa, as well as the Middle East. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic had locked down the world, so Nick and Paul couldn't go back to Mozambique. But Nick started his mission from home in Germany and kept Paul in the loop. He came in contact with various South African women who were involved in adult work to get inside information on the dangerous group in Tofo. One woman believed that this group was involved in Ellie's passing, and this gang of criminals was highly suspicious, to put it mildly. Nick was informed of a drug dealing gang that also dabbled in robbery and other violent crimes. They were so violent and so powerful that even the police were at their beck and call. Essentially, this gang ran Tofo, and there was nothing the police could do about it. They were outnumbered and overpowered. Nick knew that he had to get more information, so he had virtual meetings with different women either with backgrounds in criminal activity or who were previously involved in the gang. Nick knew he was playing with fire, but he was an expert in his line of work and he knew that the Warren family needed answers. So he went through a long list of women and finally came across one who seemed perfect for a secretive inside investigation into the gang. Nick assigned the woman with the task to befriend members of the gang and get a confession out of them about whether they had any hand in Ellie's passing or not. And sure enough, after two weeks of trying to get into the good books of the gang, the crime lord talked, and unbeknownst to the boss, the woman was recording him. He confessed to distributing illegal substances, robbing tourists, and even driving people to their deaths. His confession was vague, and he didn't necessarily mention Ellie by name, but he was known to lure tourists and take advantage of them in more scary ways than one, so it wouldn't be above him to commit such a heinous act. We know this gang was operating in the area at the time that Ellie lost her life, and we know that he was more than willing to take advantage of young women while they were in the area, so the pieces certainly fit. The woman immediately relayed the information to Nick, and as of now, the running theory is that Ellie was approached by the members of the Tofo gang at the beach who proceeded to rob her, among other things. When Ellie resisted, they overpowered her, took advantage of her, and violently ended her life. Afterwards, her body was taken to a nearby public toilet block and was framed to look like an accident. And the police even went along with their actions and proceeded to cover up the whole thing. Now, keep in mind, this is just a theory, but if it has any truth at all, and let's be honest, it probably does, then imagine how corrupt the Mozambican police really are. They're ready to cover up a crime scene and make it look like something entirely different without any blow to their conscience. 
It's so terrifying to imagine what the residents of Mozambique have to endure, knowing that the detectives will do nothing for bringing their people justice, and they can simply sweep things under the rug, dust their hands off, and act like nothing happened. For those of you watching who live in the Western world, you know that oftentimes our own police can be pretty corrupt. They cover things up for their own personal gain, and the true story likely never comes out. At least, not most of the time. But to see that the Mozambican police are so upfront about this, so out in the open, and no one can do a single thing about it, it's beyond terrifying. Once Paul got all of the information from Nick, he made a beeline for the Australian Embassy in South Africa and demanded that they do something. The facts were clear as day, and even though Mozambique would never invite Australian police for a formal investigation, the Australian police could wiggle their way into African territory if there was political pressure. And that's exactly what happened. In February of 2021, five years after constant back and forth, the Warren family finally received some good news for the first time in a very long time. Paul received a call from the Australian Federal Police, and he was told that they were officially ordered to investigate Ellie's death in Mozambique. With the Australian Federal Police involved in Ellie's case after years had passed, the Warren family could finally see their daughter's case reaching its end. But it's still far from over. The inquest is still ongoing, and even though a lot of time has passed, Paul is still hopeful that he and his grieving family will get answers. Paul went through a lot of pain and suffering during his quest for answers. Paul, alongside fighting for justice for Ellie, is also adamant about bringing changes to the law, especially those concerning cross-country and cross-continent deaths. He's vocal in bringing changes to international laws and the quickening pace of investigations of people passing away in other countries and other continents of the world. If the Australian police had intervened sooner, this painful torment could have subsided for the Warren family. The Mozambican detectives botched Ellie's case from the get-go, and it seems like they did so on purpose. We don't know if it was out of fear of the gang or to protect their own country's reputation, but what we do know is that regardless of the reason, the authorities were unprofessional, unethical, and immoral. The Mozambique police are at fault through and through. There's no denying that. The actions of the Mozambican detectives led to devastating consequences for the Warren family who are trying to salvage whatever closure they can from this mess of an investigation. Ellie's case, even after eight long and grueling years, is still open. Even though there's a strong suspicion of the TOFO criminal gang being involved in Ellie's passing, real and legitimate answers can only be given by the investigators of the AFP, who are now involved in Ellie's case. I feel very confident that in due time, Ellie's case will be solved. And this is another one of those incredible, unfortunate cases where we basically know exactly what happened, but we just have to prove it so that justice can be served. And proving it is often the most difficult task. After all was said and done, Ellie's ashes were scattered on the water at a local beach in Melbourne, which was Ellie's favorite place to visit with her dad. Everyone who loved Ellie showed up at her memorial to say their final goodbyes to a fighter, a nature lover, and a free-spirited young woman whose life was snatched from her so brutally. In Mozambique, Paul also set up a monument of sorts so that people don't forget Ellie and what tragedy fell on her. Ellie was a soul who craved adventure and her life was cut short so barbarically. Only when the wrongdoers pay for what they did to poor Ellie will the Warren family finally get the closure they need to move on with their lives after this tragic and sudden loss. And I, for one, can't wait to see that day. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Dave H and Donna. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered. And don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.